Welcome to Evolution of Self with me, Britannia. A couple of months ago, I did a, I posted a post on Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram and all of those things, asking people about what they thought helped them to move from hopelessness to hopefulness. And Alex Stansfield, who I'm going to be interviewing this for this week's um, episode, came back and he was talking about polyvagal theory and how our different states affect our physiology and how that physiology affects our states and various other things. And what he had to say, I found really fascinating. So I've asked him to come on and do an interview with me, which is what I'm going to be sharing with you this week. Alec works with therapists, coaches and mentors and helps them to banish stress and anxiety so that they're able to engage their clients more effectively. He works as a personal development coach and as an innate coach. Um, I hope you really enjoy our conversation. Um, there's many twists and turns and all sorts of topics are covered from coaching, um, hopelessness, the, do the polyvagal theory to motherhood and schools and depression and anxiety and all sorts of things. And if you listen carefully at the end of it, you'll hear the conclusion that I come to in regards to the, the, the state of depression and how we're actually designed in that state to release and surrender, to allow source or God or whatever it is you want to call it back into your life um, to help it turn around and transform it. Um, welcome to everybody today. Um, I'm going to be speaking with Alex Stanfield today and he responded to one of my Facebook posts and I was speaking about moving from hopelessness to feeling hopeful. And Alec had some really interesting and quite exciting insights around, I suppose, the physiology of us as humans. Is that right? And yeah, I think that's fair enough. And how it relates to sort of transitioning between those two states. And I imagine it's got to do with stress and all sorts of things. Is that right? Yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And do you want to share with everybody what you shared on the Facebook post? And we can maybe dive in a little bit deeper and I'll ask some questions around it as well. Sure. Yeah. So um, I've been helping people with stress and anxiety for many years. Um, I formally trained as a, a psychotherapist, but then I've moved on to doing sort of what I call personal development coaching, a bit like yourself, uh, Britt. Um, just to be freer from the, the, the shackles of the, the psychotherapy profession <laughs> in some senses. Um, and one of the things that uh, I, I have studied uh, wearing my psychotherapist hat is polyvagal theory. And um, this is a, a way of looking at the human physiology in relationship to how we feel about things. And when I first heard the terms, which we're probably all familiar with, fight and flight, freeze states. Yeah. My understanding when I first came across those terms was that they were relevant in situations of trauma and particularly of severe trauma. You know, so, you know, we know that when we're, we're up against it, we can, we can uh, go into fight and flight or in severe cases go into freeze. But it was through studying polyvagal theory that I realized that these are everyday conditions. It's not just for extreme trauma. That, yeah. And that was, the, that was the sort of, that made a big difference to me, understanding that. And do you want to just share a little bit about polyvagal theory then, for those of us that... Well, you were talking about hopefulness and hopelessness. Yes, yeah. I was. And so let's start with hopelessness, because it's easier to, to, to get your head around that. When you feel hopeless, you tell me, Brett, how do you feel if you're hopeless? What, what goes on for you? Um, it's almost like a shutting down. Um, yeah. There's sort of, yeah, there's sort of, it's like life, it's hard to reach out and find life. It's almost to me, I suppose, I tend to sense things and see them in pictures, I suppose. It's like being in a room and not quite knowing how to find the door. I think that's an excellent description. <laughs> and I think most people would, would relate to that. There is an element of shutdown about hopelessness, isn't there? Yeah. There's an element of giving up. And there are, I won't say it's the same thing, but I think there are very strong overlaps between that sense and the state. It's the free state. Oh, it has similarities with the free state. So in the free state, when we're really traumatized, I'm talking about you know severe uh, 
cases where somebody is so frightened that they're actually paralyzed and they, they're stop and frozen. Now, I, I, I want to emphasize that that is a real thing that happens in trauma. And, and it's very common with paramedics, for instance, who feel a sense of guilt that they didn't take action in a traumatic situation when what's actually happened is that they've become paralyzed with fear. And it's a real thing. It happens to rape victims. It happens many times in severe trauma. But what I think is really interesting is that elements of it also happen in hopelessness. So when you're hopeless, you are shut down, you are in an energy conservation state. So you're kind of like, you know, wrapped in your, your blanket. You are um, withdrawn. In severe cases, you might be dissociated. Um, but there is an element of uh, kind of retiring to our cave to, to lick our wounds about hopelessness. And if we think of this as the dorsal vagal state, um, and it's got some elements akin to the freeze state. Is dorsal vagal, is that the stressed state? It is a stress state, yes, indeed. This is, this is the book you need to read. Stephen Porges, okay. Stephen Porges, Deb Dana, editors of this, Clinical Applications of Polyvagal Theory. Now that's a fairly heavy book and it's not an easy read. And I have read it. Um, a much more practical book is the one by Deb Dana, Polyvagal Theory and Therapy. So most of what I'm relating to you in this interview is really Deb Dana's insights. Um, that's a great book for anyone who wants to look at the practical implications. But let's just talk about the vagus nerve for a minute. It's called vagus because it wanders through the body and it uh, starts at the base of the brain and it goes down the spine and it branches into two um, distinct sections. There's the ventral vagal system, which is above the diaphragm okay. um, and has quite specific um, effects on our body. And there's the dorsal vagal, which goes down below our diaphragm. Um, but the, the thing about the vagus nerve that's interesting is it connects to just about every major organ of the body, including the heart and the lungs and even our vocal system. And if we sort of just simplify it as much as we can, let's just say there are three basic vagal states. Ventral vagal at the top. This is sociable, relaxed, the feeling that you get when you're at home. You might be cooking, you might be busy, you might be resting, but you might be chatting. You're a human being. You're being human. In the middle, we have sympathetic nervous system. This is our busy, get things done, predict the future, uh, take control over everything. It's also the fight and flight state where we're active and we're trying to influence our environment. And then at the bottom, we have the dorsal vagal, which is our shutdown, energy conservation, freeze and play dead state. Okay. So essentially, I'm saying hopelessness is like this. The dorsal vagal. Dorsal vagal. And hopefulness is like this. Ventral, Ventral vagal. vagal. Okay. Now, what's really interesting about the vagus nerve is that if you get damage to it, your heart races because our natural bodily state is one of action it's to be busy it's to take action it's actually got more in common with the fight and flight state than anything else and it's the only reason that we are able to chill to sit down to relate to other people to have this conversation is because our ventral vagal nerve that's the one above the diaphragm puts the brakes on our natural inclination to be busy it says you don't have to rush after every rustling leaf in case it's a rabbit. You don't have to act on every impulse. It's okay to just chill and be friendly and be at home. But it's a break on our natural instinct to take action and to be busy. And it's what makes us sociable and it what makes us human, essentially. So when the ventral break is on, we are able to be social. We're able to be relaxed. We're able to communicate with other people. The ventral vagal nerve also affects our, our vocal cords and also our hearing. And it sensitizes our hearing to the human, the audio spectrum of the human voice. Whereas if the brake is taken off and we are either scared or we are, you don't even have to be scared. Let's say that we are concerned about the future. 
and we think, oh, we better get busy and get active in order to make things happen so that we can keep the roof over our head and all that kind of everyday modern life stuff. We take the ventral break off and we become busy, busy, busy. We try to predict the future. We try to take action. We try to influence things. If the action that we're taking doesn't resolve the challenges that we think we're facing, so, you know, let's say we, we need food, we need to hunt for food, we need to go to Tesco's and, and buy food. Um, <laughs> if we can't get what we need by taking action, whether it is confronting people or influencing things or uh, making an impact on the world, and if it repeatedly doesn't work, if our actions don't work, then we reach a point where we kind of give up and we shut down, and that's the hopeless state. That's the dorsal vagal. And then just to take you back because you were talking about if somebody has damage to the ventravagal and yeah. if um, that break is taken off then what, what what happens then your heart races so if you're in a motor accident and you have damage to your you know physical damage to your ventral vagal nerve then paramedics know that they have to slow your heart down because it'll just go into a, a really fast racing uh, mode uh, because it's fight and flight basically and I'm just curious because what you sort of what you're talking about is, I suppose, slightly in opposition to stuff that I've kind of been taught. Um, oh, good. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, and it's interesting because then I want to sort of know, like, how do you know that it's the um, that the ventravagal is the break rather than? But the reason I'm asking that is because um, when I sort of do when I connect with source or when I meditate and things like that, and I step out of, I suppose, the noise in my head then to me, there is just peace and calm and, and there's like a bliss that I can connect into. But what you're talking about almost sits in opposition to that because it's almost saying that in our natural state isn't that bliss state. Our nat natural state is to be busy and to survive. It's a survival state. Yes, yeah, so I want to make a distinction here. Our natural physical state as animals with a spine is to be busy. Okay, I'm not saying... Then with what I'm talking about, or doesn't it well, I'm it's interesting, curious. isn't it? You might, you might say that that's more associated with the ego than it is with our natural spiritual state, because I kind of agree with you um, that uh, when we connect to what to real reality, then we are... <laughs> I love that. I love that you see it as real reality. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there's, it's, it's not simple, is it? Um, I'm talking about the effect of, of, of these physiological systems on animals with a spine. It's, it's part of our evolutionary heritage, if you like. So that, for instance, if you imagine early cellular animals that have the beginnings of a spinal cord, then they twitch to move and they have to move to find food and to, to find the nutrition. It's, Say again? It's about survival. Um, to yeah, me, yeah. It's very much into the ego state because the ego state to me is all about survival and ensuring our survival. But that's almost an illusion to what the truth of who we really are as beings rather than human beings, if that makes sense. <laughs> I think there's a, there is a, a distinction to be made between um, how we relate these ideas to our physical body and to our spiritual body. I think there's there's a... That that's where the clash maybe happens. And I'm talking in purely physical terms here. And I don't want to negate the, the, the reality of what you're talking about. But I think we need to limit the conversation to just how our body responds. Because what's really interesting about these different vagal states is that if you think of them as a ladder with um, freeze at the bottom, so shut down at the bottom, action in the middle, and sociability at the top. You want to ideally stay, you want to be flexible. You want to be able to move between the states, but you want to spend more time, as, as much time as you can in the top, at the top of the ladder. That's a good place to be. In the middle and the top, not at the bottom. You don't want the to be yeah, very yeah. often. Then what's interesting to know is that where we are at any moment on that ladder, and we're going up and down it all the time, where we are is not determined by our choice. It's determined by unconscious processes. They, Paul just calls it neuroception. And what he means is unconscious perception of subtle cues of safety and danger. 
So if you are, let's start at the top of the ladder and you're feeling relaxed and chilled out and you're having a nice conversation with a friend and then something happens that needs you to take action. Something intervenes and you have to get up, get busy and, and address whatever the issue is. I mean, in extreme cases, it's someone loud running into the room, shouting and screaming at the top of their voice. What, what the hell? You know, we need to respond to that. You take the break off, you become busy, you rise to the challenge and you, you address it, but it's an unconscious process. And if the action that you take doesn't resolve the issue, um, then you take more action, you get more heated. <laughs> um, it's very rare that you go back to the ventral vagal chilled out state because stuff needs doing. If what you're doing doesn't work, then that's when you get to the hopeless state. So that's when um, the dorsal vagal kicks in and what the body is saying, and it is only the body, it's not our spirit. The body is saying, this isn't working. You need to freeze and play dead. You need to withdraw, shut down, conserve energy, and, and wait for the danger to pass, essentially. Yeah. Um, so this is physiological stuff. And I think one of the key insights that Deb Dana makes is that not only is it unconscious where you are on the ladder, but the way that we perceive everything that's going on for us is filtered according to where we are on the ladder. And she has a great way of demonstrating it. She uses a phrase that has two words, and I'll, I'll, I'll run this by you because I think it makes it really clear. Imagine the phrase, I'm done. Just three words, I am done. Two words, I'm done. If you say that to somebody who's in the shutdown hopeless state, what they hear is, I'm done. There's no point. It's, it's over. It's finished. It's over. Given up. I'm done. And even though the words are the same, if you say that to someone who's in the sympathetic state, that's in the middle of the ladder, the busy, busy, predict everything, take action state, what they hear is, I'm done, what's the next task? It's a completely different vibe. Yeah. And if you say it to someone who's in the ventral vagal state, what they hear is, I'm done, are you done yet? You know, should we go and have a drink? The way that we perceive and interpret the words that we hear is filtered through the state that we're in. Yeah. And it, it kind of explains why two people can hear completely different messages from the same words, because they're in different states, according to how safe they feel. If you feel completely safe, then you're more likely to be in the ventral vagal at the top of the ladder. If you're a little bit safe, but you need to kind of keep your eyes out, you're in the sympathetic. And if you're really not safe and you've shut down, then you're in the dorsal vagal at the bottom of the ladder. Does that help? <laughs> really interesting and what sort of comes up for me when you talk about that is how do we create a feeling of safety uh, and I'm just thinking because some people grow up in situations that are unsafe and so they're most likely on hyper alert most of the time because yeah. safety is an issue so how do we how do we create a feeling of safety so that we can rise up to those sort of upper levels rather than sit yeah. at the lower levels well I think that's an excellent question and it's one we should really give some serious thought to if you think of the ventral vagal nerve as a break, it's like any muscle, the more you use it, the more you can trust it and the stronger it gets. And if you've never used it because it hasn't felt appropriate to use it, you have a problem. And I think the only way that we can help people to start to feel safe is to first be confident and safe in our own persona, in our own situation, to use rapport and connection with people to show, to, to demonstrate that this is safe and to welcome them into a safe space. And that is why it's so vital that we are not too challenging to people who are suffering. Um, I know that there are many forms of therapy and I'm not here to you know, proselytize on a particular direction, but I think the first rule should be to help our clients to feel safe. Yeah. Because if they don't feel safe, they're processing everything through a different lens. I know in coaching, when I did my training, the International Coach Federation, part of their description of coaching as a methodology is to create a safe space. Yeah, that's the first and foremost requirement, I believe. Yeah. 
Okay, and it's funny actually, because um, I mean, I didn't learn when I did my training, I didn't learn about the physiological stuff. I think I most likely touched on it when I did A-level biology many, many, many moons ago. <laughs> But I hadn't heard about the poly polyvagal theory. Um, what I learned about was um, states. And um, the states I learned about, they named them differently. I changed the names because I didn't like the ones that they used. So the ones I use is a state of bliss, a state of um, being energized, and a state of being de-energized. And it's interesting because they seem to correspond to the states that you're talking about. So I think there's, there's they, some of that, yeah. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that... I sort of work with my clients on is that if they're in the dorsal vagal state, which for me is the de-energized state, the way to shift out of that is to start taking action in your life. Absolutely. And with, as I was listening to what you were saying as well, um, I was thinking that when you're in the middle, in the action state, if you're constantly taking action from, I suppose, a place of fear and the action isn't working, then what, what I sort of how I work with people is to get them into a state of um, I suppose it's letting go of the fear so it's being a very present state and then choosing action from there because that action tends to have much more impact mm -hmm. than if you're taking action from a state of fear yes what that yes. brings up for you a million things <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm looking at your face now it's easy. <laughs> I think the way I look at fear, um, and its associated ally, anxiety, um, is that it's really essential that we experience anxiety. If we didn't, if you've ever been for a, in a passenger in a car by a driver who has no sense of anxiety, you'll know it's a terrifying experience. <laughs> Especially when you do have a healthy dose of anxiety. <laughs> anxiety is there to keep us safe. It draws our attention to danger. You know, if we if we want to cross the road, it's quite right that we have a little sense of, oh, I wonder if there's any cars coming, because that helps us to look left and right and, and cross the road safely. So I, I, I like the saying that anxiety is a really useful signpost, but it's a terrible destination. If you end... If you end up in a situation where you're constantly anxious, then it's serving no purpose. It's only helpful to us when it instructs us to take appropriate action. And yet we know that lots of people struggle with anxiety. And the way that I look at it nowadays is a little bit strange. I don't, I don't know whether you'll, whether you'll relate to this or not, but... You'll, I guess you know the, the work of Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now, yeah? So I really like the idea that if we wanna take action, and action isn't always the right course, you know, the right thing to do, but if we wanna take action, we can only do it now. We can only breathe in the present. We can't breathe in the past or the future. You know, our point of power is always the here and now. Yeah. So if you look at what anxiety is telling you, is the danger or the thing that you're anxious about here and now, is it present? Because if it isn't, it's either in the past or the future. You're either worrying about something that might happen tomorrow or you're worrying about something that has happened in the past. And the thing that informs the way I work with my clients is that, and this is where it gets a little bit hard to get your head around. It's a very simple concept, but, but, but it's a bit of a challenge in some ways, is that the only way we can access the past or the future is through narrative. It's through story. Yeah, it's the sense-making part of us. Yeah, it the sense-making. And then it tries to make sense of what has happened, what will happen. And none yeah. of it's actually truth either. No. It's <laughs> our spin on what actually happened or what yeah. we think will happen. Idris Shah has a wonderful way of saying it. History is not what happened. It's what some people think was important about what happened. It's the narrative <laughs> yeah. that we give it. Yeah. And so if you kind of take that to its logical limits, in order to create a narrative, first you have to name things. You have to say, that is a character in my story, or that is a concept that matters. You have to label and put boundaries around things to create a narrative. And you have to put them in some kind of sequence. And when you realize that everything that you think you know has come to you in the form of narrative, apart from your current sensory here and now input. That is 
that is worth paying attention to. That's why it's it important to be mindful about the here and now. Yeah. But everything else is just narrative. So when you look at anxiety and fear from that perspective, that gives you opportunities to question the narrative that you've created that is causing that anxiety or that fear. Yeah. I've, I've made a bit of a meal of that, but, I, but it means that anxiety that's in the moment is relevant and worth acting upon. Anything else is of questionable value. Is <laughs> the illusion that you've painted life with. Yeah, yeah. It's the story of, of you know, whether your story is a victim story or a survivor story or a... Uh, story. <laughs> yeah whatever whatever it is it's still a story so. yeah. that's really quite fascinating I, I love talking with you I mean Alec and I know each other sort of personally as well um and I love it because we we think very similar things but we approach it very differently and yeah. our sort of I suppose our learning has been very different so our language around stuff is very different but the underlying understanding I think is very similar Yes, yes, I agree. And, that, and it's quite nice because sometimes we kind of approach things from completely opposite <laughs> directions. But well, the beauty of that is, though, that something kind of a deeper understanding comes out of it, because if you're not challenged, then you don't question things. So yes. I love that because I love the challenge because it makes me sort of look at what I think I know and ask questions about it and hopefully sort of get a deeper understanding. So let's take the one that came up 10 minutes ago in this conversation when you said, that I think if I heard you right, you said something like you believe that our default state is one of bliss. Yes. Uh, what I mean by that, and I'm just going to clarify so that it, when you talk into it, hopefully it's what I meant rather than maybe the story you put onto what yeah, I Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that when you take away all of the things that you think are wrong in the world or the challenges or anything that you need to take action on, when all of that is taken out, then what you're left with is a state of bliss. Yes. But what do you do in a state of bliss? Um, for me, it's for me, it's actually a creative space. Quite often okay. when I'm in that when I'm in that bliss state, it's when I get inspiration. Um, I feel expanded. I feel connected to things. Um, I might feel inspired to contact somebody to say hello to somebody. It's it, it, it's right. I'm, I'm, like, I'm, I'm with you. So yeah, I think that was really important for me because when you first said the word, I had a different interpretation. And this is the problem we have with words, of course, because for me, a state of bliss, what I first heard was a state of inactivity where you're just in awe of the connectedness of the universe and there's nothing that needs to be done and no action that needs to be taken. And the idea that I might want to choose to spend the rest of my life in a state of bliss ain't going to work. <laughs> right? But the way... But having said that, um, I don't think that that isn't part of it. I think you could be in awe and in that space. But I yes. think that when you're in that, it's such a connected space that source or God or whatever it is, spirit, whatever you want to call it, it's not an inactive space. No, so I'm, I'm happy with that you've said that. List out, but then you would be moved to take action from that space. But the action would be very, very different. It would be inspired action rather than fear-based reaction reaction. Absolutely. I'm in 100% agreement with you. And I'm so glad that I, I, I wanted to clarify that because I didn't get it when you first said it, because I would use the word flow for the state that you've just described. Yeah, I think they're interchangeable. Yeah. So, so when you're in flow, you take inspired action yeah. and everything flows. And, and, the, and the phrase that you will have heard me say in the past or the, or the word that I used to describe that is it feels like you're going downstream. You're not swimming right. against the the, I the know tide. Where you get that phrase from. <laughs> That's from Abraham Hicks, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. But it's a great way of describing it because you don't have to paddle hard. You know, you're actually in a river, and everything is is, uh, what's the word? Um, it's carrying you. Yeah, but it's also um, what's the cooperating? Everything seems to cooperate to help you to get further downstream. And, and it, everything flows and it's wonderful. And Bindi and I, Bindi's my wife and my business partner, um, who I know you also know, I'm just explaining. If we go away for a couple of days or if we go on holiday, we're almost always in that state of flow where just things just click into place. And we're gradually getting to a place where we where we can make that happen in our working life as well, but it hasn't always been quite so easy. It's interesting, isn't it, how 
I suppose how we're conditioned not to be in that space when we are doing technically work, if you know what I mean. Yeah, um, and, and it is conditioning, isn't it? It is, It's and it's years of conditioning. It's from birth, watching our parents do it, watching everyone around us do it. If you think people in sort of corporate, um, you know, in sort of capital cities and cities all around the world, you know, they don their suits. You know, they, they sort of, they put on a different face, a different personality when they walk into work. Yes. It's, it's and I grew up in an age where it was it was the right thing to do was to draw a very clear distinction between your working life and your private life. And, you know, in the early days of Facebook, I had a work profile and a, and a, and a home profile. And it was a bit of a head stretch for me to 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 share my vulnerability, if you want to use Brenny Brown's way of putting it, by only having one, one profile <laughs> and, and not putting on the suit and tie, because uh, that was the world I, I grew up in. Um, but downstream, yeah, downstream is a good way of putting it, really. Yeah, yeah, I, I do like, I like the terminology that Abraham Hicks used. I saw a meme on Facebook just yesterday by Buckminster Fuller, uh, who was a, a very inspiring individual. Um, I built a geodesic dome tent um, many years ago. He invented the, uh, the geodesic dome. And he said, "Where some, I'll have to paraphrase it because I haven't got it in front of me, but he said something like, where did this fallacy come from that we all have to work to earn a living? We have had so much technical technological progress now. It's not a requirement that everybody goes to work. And in fact, this is a theme that Bindi and I often get kind of passionate about is the idea that motherhood is is downgraded in our work-based society and that actually it's not only a vital role but it should be given more credibility given more money given given more raised as a, as a vital thing to be done because the way we raise our children you know and, and we're still telling people we're still telling young mums to kind of get back to work, put your kids in a nursery and, and give the nurturing to somebody else. It just seems kind of bonkers to me. Yeah, and, and just to say that people who are listening to this, um, Bindi works um, with mothers. That's, yeah. what, how, what would you describe her sort of title, what she does? She would call herself a motherhood mentor. A motherhood and she's mentor. interested in all aspects of motherhood. When you use the phrase motherhood, we have noticed that most people think you mean, oh, having babies, but motherhood, doesn't start or end with babies it's a role that you play once you know once you've had a child it's a role that you have for the rest of your life um and so you know honoring elders grandmothers uh, coping with teenage children um the whole bringing the balance to our patriarchal way of looking at things is a motherhood it's a feminine energy uh, thing and it's been largely stamped upon <laughs> really in the last 300 years. I, I would completely agree with you. Um, I remember I think one of the hardest I've <laughs> because of my I suppose devotion to sort of becoming consciously aware and things like that um, I took motherhood very seriously <laughs> right from the word go and you know I don't necessarily know that even my family know the thought that I put into how I speak to my children um, what I allow them, the space I allow them, and all those things. And I think one of the hardest things for me was letting them go to school. So essentially yeah. letting people that I had no idea of their values, um, their ideals, you know, letting them be in charge of a major portion of my child's life. And it wasn't what they were teaching them. It was who they were being with my children. Um, yeah. that I found just a really scary concept. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we think that our kids learn more from their peers than they do from their parents in some senses, you know, in terms of how to behave and how to, how to relate to the world. So, yeah, I think that conditioning starts right from the very first day or even before the first day and continues through our whole life. I'm reading a very interesting series of books at the moment by an author by the name of Caleb Seth Pearl, unusual name, um, KSP he's referred to as, and he's talking about the whole conditioning thing and the fact that we are far more, it's a little bit sinister, uh, and I don't tend to go into negative stuff, so it's, it's sort of, you have to take it with a pinch of salt, but there is clear evidence that our media is manipulated, for instance. There's clear evidence that a lot of what we're told as normal is actually a construct. And so uh, it's helping people to kind of realize 
where the chains are and to try and break free from them become, by becoming more conscious and more aware of, of our own journey and our own reality. That doesn't really surprise me. And I'm not really into conspiracy theories purely because I don't like the energy about it. It makes me tend to sort of, I pick up on the fear that sort of generates from that way of thinking. But it doesn't surprise me that um, our society is conditioned because most people are conditioned. We are so conditioned. How would the yeah. people that are in power not condition the people that they're in power yeah. of? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. And yeah. to me, the only way out of that is exactly as you've said, it's about becoming more conscious and more aware. And that's why my, my organization is called Innate, because actually I, I sincerely believe that if you know yourself and you know not only what is you and what is within you, but also what is out there and what is not you, when you start to look at that edge carefully, yeah. then, then I believe that you get insights and wisdom. I agree. And, and it's there is so much depth to the conditioning that we have. I mean, I remember um, years ago... Um, when I used to run a wine business and obviously there was quite a bit of socializing and <laughs> whatever else. <laughs> and Sounds like a good business. Like, yeah. Like many people, I worked Monday to Friday, nine to five and come Friday, I looked forward to going out and having a drink with my friends. And then the weekend was all about socializing. And then one year I decided, cause at the time I used to smoke as well. Um, I was a social smoker more than anything else. And I knew that I wouldn't give up smoking if I didn't give up drinking because the two kind of went hand in yeah. hand. And so I decided I'd give up both for a year. And suddenly my whole world changed. And then I started doing my coach training as well. And if my life wasn't built around the socializing of the end of the week and the weekend and then back to work the following week, I was left with a weekend with like, what do I do with it? Because wow. I didn't want to go out and just go drinking with people because it wasn't fun anymore. Um, yeah. And actually, I, I enjoyed not drinking. Yeah. I enjoyed how I felt when I wasn't drinking and while I wasn't smoking. And then it was kind of, then I found I did sort of work. I ended up doing my work on the weekends as well as during the week. But I actually enjoyed my work. But I felt bad doing it because conditioning said that, you know, you're, you know, you're becoming a workaholic. <laughs> and it's just, and I'm only sharing that because of the layers of conditioning that we have that we don't even contemplate or think about. Um, how well, we dress, how we behave, how we go about our, everything. It, you're right. That it struck me at a very young age because my parents were fairly strict and they had their own strong values and things that they cared about. Many of which I, I've inherited and, and, and subscribed to, but some of which I haven't. One of their rules was that we had to dress up and wear a jacket and tie for Sunday lunch, and I used to say. I hate wearing a tie, Mum. I don't. I don't like a tight thing around my neck. Why do I need to wear a tie for Sunday lunch? And the answer that she gave, and it sort of shaped my life, was, "It's what normal people do." <laughs> well, right. I'm never going to be one of them. <laughs> Quiet rebel from that point onwards, really. Yes, definitely. Not happy to accept the norms of. Well, you don't do something because that's what everybody does. You know that. That's. That's not a good argument for me. <laughs> no, it's not for me. And for me, it's almost like living in a Tupperware box. Um, and when you start looking beyond doing stuff because that's what other people do or that's what everyone does, you suddenly start taking the top off the Tupperware box and suddenly start yeah. looking at all the possibilities that are out there for a life that's completely uniquely yours. Yes. And I think that's the challenge that we face now is to find out how we can survive in these turbulent times whilst paying homage to who we really are yeah. because we're so different and so unique and we have such incredible knowledge insights experiences to share you know things that we maybe don't even think are, are relevant because we've learned them through the course of our daily life to other people can be an absolute revelation so i i have a great dislike of language i try not to react to it but when i hear people using the phrase oh he's a bright person he's a bright boy I, I always it always puzzles me because i kind of think to use that language means that you can at some level perceive a scale where there is bright at one end and presumably the opposite of bright dim or, or whatever it is at the other end and there are such things as bright people 
and less bright people. Now, I know there's a real thing called IQ, and I know that it relates to problem solving ability. And I know that what people are saying is that they, that bright person is switched on, they can learn, they can apply themselves, they have a, maybe a high IQ. But that's irrelevant in the modern world. Everybody is a supernova. If, you know, Einstein's thing, if you judge everyone's ability by, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live the whole of its life thinking it's stupid. Every single person has something unique and amazing to offer. And we need to start recognizing that and dropping this language of bright people because it's just, it's, it's not true. It's a distortion and it's a condition thing. And it's because of our education system and, you know, the whole it's way right. that's system it's, is structured what's, it's what people have put value on yeah they've valued people that are, are highly intelligent um, and they haven't valued creativity and all the other things as much i think it's beginning to change i think um i've read a number of times how um people predict that creativity in the future is going to be i suppose more highly valued because yeah. computers and all sorts of other things can do the intellectual part almost quicker than <laughs> yes. Yes. people have you seen that wonderful TED talk by um, Kenneth, Sir Kenneth Robinson? I might have done. Just remind it's, me what it's about again. I think it's called Changing Education Paradigms or something like that. It's quite old now. It's been around for quite a few years, but it's a yes, wonderful yeah. talk. There's an animated version by the Royal Society of Arts. Um, but Sir Kenneth Robinson, YouTube, Education Paradigms. It's really brilliant. And he, he, he talks about the education system and he doesn't, focus on the conditioning element of it but it's clearly in resonates with what we were talking about five minutes ago he talks about the idea that the insanity of putting kids of the same age together in batches and processing through our, our education system and the only thing they have in common is their sell-by date <laughs> i know it's absolutely nuts it's something i must admit i i, I really struggled with with my children because my children are both dyslexic as well in fact our whole family is pretty much dyslexic or my side of it anyway. Um, and I also did a lot of reading. I, I went to a Rudolf Steiner school as a kid. Oh, and, I didn't know that. Um, obviously being interested in all the stuff that I'm interested in. Um, another person that I um, connected with years ago was a, a guy called Dr. D. Martini. And I was fascinated because he said that, because he was also incredibly dyslexic. In fact, he, he ended up living homeless because he couldn't read. And he only learned to read, I think at about the age of 18 I might be wrong on the age or whatever else and now he's a doctor and all sorts of things and he said there's no such thing as dyslexia or ADHD or anything like that they're just gifts that we don't know how to use yet yeah um, absolutely. And I just love that um but something I just wanted to say as well is that all the things that Alec and I are talking about I'm going to put in links to them in the show notes below so if you want to look at a certain book that Alex mentioned or a YouTube clip or whatever else, all of those will be below in the show notes so that you can access them and learn more about them if you're interested. Fantastic. So one to add to that is a book by Ron Davis called The Gift of Dyslexia. Do you know that one? I read that. I cried yeah. when I read that book because one, it was like somebody could actually understand me because I'm dyslexic. And it was also me understanding myself. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I read it and I suddenly for the first time I, I understood why I was the way I was and why my mind worked differently. And yeah, it was it was if, if anyone has got dyslexia or got knows someone that's got dyslexia, you must read that book. It was really phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. And he worked it out himself, didn't he? He was an engineer who yeah. kind of just sat down one day and thought, why am I struggling? <laughs> I mean, I knew that I struggled and it was my mum's um, a special needs teacher. And um, <laughs> I remember I was an adult and she put me through some dyslexia test to sort of grade me on something or other that she was trying to figure out. It's the joy of having a parent that's into dyslexia is you never kind of grow past being tested for it. Um, and what I realized with maths was that with, with dyslexia to be able to cope in the normal world and, and at school, you inadvertently, and I mean, I didn't even realize this, create strategies to deal with all the things or to try and create workarounds to learn what you're trying to be taught. And what I realized is I can't do maths backwards. So <laughs> I, would, I would change everything around in my head so that if I was subtracting, I actually ended up adding. I can't remember exactly oh, wow. how to explain it. But yeah. you can imagine the exhaustion of trying yeah. <laughs> to do everything at the normal speed of everyone else whilst having to change everything around so that my mind could cope with understanding things in a certain way. 
<laughs> it's so interesting, isn't it? These days I have a, a, a theme that, that I'm, everywhere I look, I see supernovas. What I mean is that if you look around, there are explosions of growth happening. Yeah. And there are explosions of people becoming aware of stuff or having an idea or doing something creative. And um, I, I just kind of urge everyone to look for the supernovas because that's the idea that everything is static and stable and nothing's changing just isn't true. You look at a, a cornfield and you look at the actual piece of corn and it's bursting with life and it's doing absolutely everything it can to reach up and reach the sunshine and, and to grow. And to, I think when you can look at nature from that perspective, you can see that everything is supernovas going off all the time. And actually tying that back into what we were talking about with children in school, one of the things that, and, I, and as, as a parent, I would not say that this has been easy because society puts certain conditions and expectations. But what I've always tried to do with my children is encourage them in the things that they're interested in because yeah. it's almost allowing their supernova to, to blossom and to grow because yeah. they know inside themselves what means something to them. They know what gives them joy and what expands them and what they want to learn about. Um, I think that's for me one of the hardest things with schools is the constraint that they're not able to necessarily follow the things that they would be passionate about. Yeah, and again, it's like going downstream, isn't it? But my daughter, when she was about 18 months old, used to draw on the wallpaper. She was always drawing. And we used to say, Laurie, I love your drawing, but please don't do it on the wallpaper. Here's a piece of paper. But I, I feel a sense of pride because she's now making a living as an illustrator of children's books. And yet most parents or many parents would have said at the age of, I don't know, teenage years, oh, you, you'll never make a living out being an artist. That's a really hard route you know, do something more sensible, you know, train to be a something else or whatever. But we did exactly what you said. And we knew that Laurie had an innate talent for drawing, for cartoons and for expressing herself visually. Um, and we never stopped praising that and encouraging her to do that. And she started to believe in it, I think after we did in a sense. And I'm so delighted now that she's actually making a success of it. It's, it's, a, it's not an easy thing to do. And actually, my, my eldest son's the same. I mean, he's always, always been a bit of an adventurer, always been absolutely passionate about wildlife, and then always interested in photography, always wanted to nick my camera. But I, I wasn't really paying attention to that. But as he went through school, he ended up doing photography and just fell in love with it. And exactly as you say, I mean, on a logical point of view, if I was looking at sort of society and, you know, the re prerequisites and stuff like that, I would say that there's just, you know, don't do photography. It's, you know, it's too niche and it's too hard to break into and whatever and whatever. And at the moment, he's out in the Okavango Delta in Botswana making wildlife movies. So Amazing, amazing. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's hard as a parent to have faith sometimes and to yeah. have the courage to allow your children to explore what's, what's really inside them. But yeah. um, I'm, I'm very glad that I did for one, that's for sure. So all I need to do now is figure out what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> Alec. <laughs> yeah, <maybe. laughs> I went into engineering early on which is why I have a kind of a why I approach things from physical first I guess yeah. um, and that was really because my dad was a, a chartered mechanical engineer and he, he saw his middle age middle son thinking about doing I think I was considering doing physics and music at university and he was I'm not having you doing two half assed subjects. You need to do one properly. And he found an engineering course and kind of pushed me towards that. And then having become sponsored to do engineering, electronic engineering, I felt I had a kind of a duty to, to the people who were paying me a salary as a student. So I completely jumped into that engineering perspective and I learned math, physics and chemistry and, and did the scientific thing to a huge degree. Um, and lived that way for the first, I don't know, 15, 20 years of my work in life before I had the first of my midlife crises. Um, and now I embrace them on a regular basis. <laughs> well, this thing is with those crises, when, when, you, when everything falls apart, something beautiful grows out from it, doesn't it? That's true. That's true. And in fact, going back to what we were saying earlier, when things did fall apart for me, which was uh, about 25 years ago, I became divorced and depressed almost at the same time. I can remember one day 
having a real insight um, because I was feeling sorry for myself. I was going into what was quite a deep depression. It didn't last too long, I'm happy to say, but it did start me getting interested about what depression was because it wasn't like I thought it was going to be if I had any sense of what I thought it would be. It completely floored me. It stopped me in my tracks and it was a shocking experience to become depressed. What was it like for you? I'm only asking because people listening might all have different experiences. I couldn't think and I've always lived on my wits so I couldn't work and I couldn't prioritize. I couldn't do anything and I can remember I was so immobilized. I was in a dorsal vagal shut down state. I was in energy conversation, conservation. I'd gone back into my hole. I'd withdrawn. I'd given up. And I was complete. I might have looked to the outside world. I would have looked a bit sad, like, you know, a yeah. bit shut down. Inside, what was going on was, what the fuck is happening? Excuse my French. But what, what on earth is happening? Why can I not think anymore? What has happened to me? This is the most scary thing ever. So inside there was a huge amount of anxiety and circular thoughts and, and catastrophizing. But outside I would just look like I was shut down. And then this one particular day I was sat on the sofa. I lived on a narrow boat. I had very few um, possessions. I, had, I was living a, quite a, a poor life in some ways. Um, well, let's say an aesthetic life. <laughs> I had mains electricity, but I didn't have an engine. <laughs> I didn't have running water. And I remember thinking one day, I was living on narrowboat because it allowed me to be near my children um, because I was also paying for the house that my wife was still living in before we got divorced. And this one day, I can remember I sat on this sofa and I was so frustrated that I couldn't even work out whether to make myself a cup of tea or not. Shall I get up and make a cup of tea or shall I just sit here? I couldn't even work out what I wanted or how to do it or anything. I was so completely paralyzed in my thinking. It was just shocking. And then I thought, am I poor, miserable, misunderstood, rejected, middle-aged bloke who's moved out of the family home, who's no longer living with his children, who he loves completely, who's been misunderstood by his the wife that he lived with for 20 years or whatever. This was a very feeling sorry for myself state. It's like poor, misunderstood, middle-aged bloke. And then the next moment I had this thought, yeah, but actually, if I wanted to, I could go out to a club tonight. I'm young, free and single. I have no ties. The whole world is my oyster. And it was so stark, the polarization that I could be this or I could be that. And that was the moment that I realized that's just the story I'm telling myself. I can tell myself whatever story I want. They're both true. I am young, free and single because I never did my sort of uh, my wild teenage years because I met my wife when I was very young and, and we were living like a married couple by the time we were sort of 18. So I'd never really explored that side of myself. So there was a drive to be young, free and single, but there was also this I'm depressed and misunderstood and middle-aged and have this burden of the world on my shoulders. And noticing that that was a narrative was really eye-opening for me because the story that we tell to the world of, of what our journey is and where we're going and where we've been completely shapes what we experience in life and, and, and how we approach things. Well, so that becomes, was- It becomes who we are because the story we tell ourselves creates how we feel it creates the energy that we are it creates how we react and interact with the world and it becomes yeah. our reality so and it Absolutely. is I, I love the way that when you change the story and you change the thoughts in your head everything changes yeah. Um, but it's, yeah it's being able to have the space to see that that you are your story yeah and it's like the trunk of the tree you know our, our life is made of all these little narratives which are like twigs or branches and each twig if you hold a twig in your hand it's got a beginning a middle and an end and you put them all together, you've got a tree and the, and who you think you are is like the trunk of the tree. That's how I kind of visualize it almost. That's a beautiful analogy. So that was a real turning moment for me. And it also made me curious about what has happened to my brain? What has, what is this shut down state? What's really going on here? And why has it happened to me? I mean, I knew I was a bit stressed. That 
experience sowed the seed for me later to study depression and to learn what it was. And I was absolutely stunned. I was shocked actually a few years later to hear a man on a stage in front of about 70 people saying the most arrogant thing I'd ever heard in my life. And what he said was this, he said, of course, we now understand the causes of depression. We understand what help, what keeps people locked in the cycle of depression. And best of all, we understand how to help people out of depression. <laughs> and I thought, what are you selling? <laughs> What, what I've just come to a conclusion, and this, is, this isn't this um, is a definite, this is the truth, but it's something that I'm pondering, which what I love with these conversations is quite often they loop back and tie it to themselves together, is, you know, when you're talking about the shutdown state, do you think it's our body's way of almost trying to, to switch us off so that we can reaccess, if you think of it on a soul level? I mean, if everything in us shut down, then we would basically be open to accessing an, an inner wisdom. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Um, because I think, I mean, I've been in similar states at times when things have gone on in my life. And I remember having an insight once when all I could really do was sit and watch TV because I just didn't have, because it, it was helping me switch off. Because as soon as I wasn't watching TV, my mind was working in a way that was just too yeah. stressful and too, made me too anxious. And I suddenly had this insight that I could watch TV feeling guilty and feeling like I was a failure and um, feeling upset with myself. Or I could watch TV and just enjoy myself. And as soon as I did it from the enjoyment side of it, rather than, my God, I'm such a useless person side of it, I suddenly felt my energy lift. And it was like, it took like not even a minute for me to suddenly feel like I wanted to get up and go and do something. Yeah. Um, I... And, I, and I kind of wonder if, I mean, I just, I always look at sort of, I suppose, how we've been created. And the more I sort of understand it, the more I see how the, it's just the most incredible thing that we are. Yeah. And most yeah. of it is designed to help us move towards consciousness if we knew that that was what it was trying to do. Yes, yes, I think that's right. I think you do get insights when you're in that back in your cave shut down state, but it's not a guaranteed thing. And I think that there's another factor that you need to be aware of, I guess or that help, it helped me to understand it, which is that, you know, I said that when I was depressed, it looked like I was sad, yeah. but inside there was a boiling ferment of anxiety and, and, and worry. And one of the things that, again, this is an insight about the physical body, um, is that strong emotions stop us being able to think at all. Yeah. And yeah. that whilst emotions are really vital, they're our guidance system, they... They tell us which direction to move in. They emotivate us. We have to, we, we need to evolve to a point where we understand that people who are frightened can't learn. People who are anxious are not open to thinking clearly. That strong emotions make us functionally stupid. And it's part of being human that that's the case. So when you're in that hopeless state, if you are, if you're genuinely given up, and kind of got to a point where you just don't care anymore, then that may be an opportunity for an insight to come along. But if you're still in the state where you're, I just need to stay still, I need to sort of not move, I need to not connect in with anybody because the world isn't safe, then we need to be aware that the people in that state can't think, they cannot prioritize, they cannot function in, in the normal way that we expect. So I don't think in that state you are able to access your imagination or creativity or rational mind or any of that stuff. Uh, yeah, I, th I agree with you. I think it's more when you're in that state and you stop making it wrong and stop fighting it. Yeah. And it's yeah. letting go and, and accepting and just completely surrendering to it that you then create the space to allow inspiration, connection. Absolutely. And you've reminded me of another thing that Deb Dana says about the polyvagal um, message, which is that most of us are aware of the language that we talk about being triggered. Yeah. So when we use that word trigger, what we normally mean, but I want to check this out with you, Britt, if your understanding is the same, is that some event in the past, some experience that we had that was either frightening or unpleasant or something that we wouldn't want to happen in the, again, 
oops, if we're in a situation in the current moment that has resemblances to that previous experience, then we get triggered. The emotions that we get are the emotions that we had back then when we were humiliated or shamed or scared or whatever it was. And we regress to that sort of um, the fear response that we might have had back then. So being triggered is language that sort of says we go down the ladder away from being human and sociable and feeling at rest and at home and hopeful and down the ladder towards hopelessness. But what Deb Dana points out, and I think you've kind of alluded to it in your story, is that there is a mechanism that works in the opposite direction and she calls this glimmers. So glimmers are the things that light us up. And sometimes just chilling out on the sofa and watching meaningless TV can be, oh, a rest from this. Actually, I feel at peace with this. More often it's being inspired or seeing something that lights us up or doing something that gives us even just a momentary glimpse of the flash of the diamond, if you like. Yeah. But sometimes it's just a tiny thing that can lift our spirits and make us think, oh, wow, that was nice. And we need to focus on the glimmers, not the triggers. You know, we need to actually list them. What lights you up? What takes you up the ladder? What gives you a sense of awe? What gets you inspired about things? Yeah. Um, but it starts from for yourself to do those things as well. I know for me, one of the things that really... I suppose connects me and it's part of my whole life nowadays is to go out and walk in nature definitely that's definitely a glimmer for me <laughs> yeah I, I discovered a four mile circular walk that i can do from my door that goes through woods which have got bluebells at the moment mm. and goes across fields and involves only i don't know half a mile of road the rest of it is all footpaths and it's a circular walk and i try to do it as regularly as i can and it absolutely it's never the same twice Oh, I love it. It's either the weather's different or the season's different or there's... Or I'm different. Something. Exactly. I'm the same. I've got a number of different walks that I do and, and I do. I feel exactly the same. Every time I go along, I, I look at things and I think, my God, this is never, ever the same one day to the next. Um, one of the things I've noticed about, I wonder whether you have this experience too, is that some days I'm in my head and I'm thinking while I'm walking and I'm really enjoying the process of privacy, no interruptions, I can just think my thoughts, and my body's almost in automatic mode, it's doing walking, and I walk fairly fast, so it's, it's getting my lungs going, it's getting my circulation going, it's getting my metabolism going, but I'm very much in my head. Other times, I'm not in my head at all, and I'm very present, and I'm just amazed at the beauty of the woods, and, the, and, and, the, and it doesn't matter which one I'm in, they both work for me, but it's, it, they're very different ways of experiencing the walk. Do you do both of those as well? Um, I do, although when I notice that I'm in my head, because my walks, it's funny, my walks aren't just for a physical thing. I, I do my walks because I find inspiration. I solve the problems that I'm facing at work. If I'm doing a course, I kind of ponder it while I'm walking and inspiration comes to me about what I need to share. So they're very integral to my whole way of life. So when I do walk and I'm in my head, I don't get the benefit. So then I focus on my breathing or I try and focus on my physical body and then I expand myself into the space that I'm in. So if I find I'm in my head, I try to move out of my head so that I can connect. Because right. For me, that's, I, I, that's one of the joys of walking. That's, that's my connection space. Right, yeah, yeah. But it's so important. I, I feel that I can think better when I walk than any other time. Yeah, I, I, I used to do quite a lot of running. I don't run quite so much anymore now and walking has, I suppose, taken place of that. Um, if I've got a particular problem that I can't let go of, I almost imagine throwing it up into the universe and then I just leave it. And as I'm walking along, sort of normally, I don't know, five, ten minutes, half an hour later, suddenly an idea or an answer or an inspiration will pop into my head. It's such fun. <laughs> it's magic. Magic, yeah. It's magic. Like that. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, we have gone over our time and I'm very aware yeah. of that, but I, <laughs> we were so busy fun. chatting, I didn't want to kind of interrupt, but I think no, we need to sort of say goodbye and to thank everybody so much for joining us today. And thank you to Alec for all the wonderful wisdom and ideas and questions and challenges that you've brought that is going to keep me busy <laughs> pondering for many a day to come. So thank well, you. Well, so thanks much. for the opportunity to share stuff with you, Britt. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode or this week's episode. 
and if you want to connect with me and find out about my coaching or any of my online courses then just have a look below all of my details are all my social media links are there and my website and you can connect with me through any of those platforms also if you've enjoyed this episode and you don't want to miss out and you want to hear more then make sure you subscribe and like so that you will get weekly updates when i release the next episodes lots of love from me to you bye, -bye.